On our planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. Today, we shall discover that when one hears Mongolia, one should think of more than just the desert and camels. The environment of the Gobi Desert is so diverse, you can find everything from uncharacteristic ice passes to breathtaking waterfalls and lakes. From the Gobi semi-desert, we will move on to the lush, green, northern Mongolian hillsides that provide refuge for Buddhists. 5,000 kilometers further southeast of the Gobi lies Jordan. We will conclude our journey in the footsteps of Indiana Jones, in the Jordanian Petra, and on the shores of the Dead Sea. But first, we visit the land of Genghis Khan. Gobi, Hanhai, or Gebi. All these words are the names of the Gobi Desert in different languages. The Gobi is one of the oldest deserts in the world. Its surface area is an incredible 1.3 million square kilometers. The Gobi Desert remains largely unexplored due to its immense size. It stretches between the Altai mountain range in the north, the Tibetan Plateau in the southwest, and the Great Wall of China in the southeast. Its extreme size goes hand in hand with extreme temperature differences. In the winter, the temperature can drop as low as minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, while in the summertime, the temperature can climb up to 113 degrees Fahrenheit. Only a few living beings survive such drastic temperature differences. One of the adventurers that got carried away by the magic of the Gobi Desert was Sven Hedin, a Swedish discoverer. He described his caravan as follows. Our camp, with its many packages and animals, made a very picturesque appearance, and it gave me a feeling of deep satisfaction to think that all those things were mine. It can be stated with confidence that not much has changed since in the Gobi Desert. Five ecoregions are found in the Gobi, each of which has an entirely different soil composition. Each year, the desert claims several extra kilometers. The southern reaches of the Gobi have been devouring pastures on the Chinese border for the last 20 years. Each year, the greedy masses of sand absorb 20 centimeters of rainfall. That's not a lot of rainfall, but people and animals can adapt to even the harshest of conditions. In search of better pastures, the Mongolians migrate up to four times a year. Their entire household, complete with yurt, travels along with them. The art of assembling and disassembling the yurt has been perfected over the millennia. It is just another facet of the nomadic lifestyle. The yurt is constructed to withstand bitterly cold weather. Four people are required to assemble it. A trap is stretched over the wooden framework and then it's lined with hides and other firm materials for making the yurt waterproof during periods of rain and as insulation during cold nights. The resulting area that they live in is not particularly large, but it serves these nomads very well. The complete erection process of the yurt takes just a few hours. It's perfectly eco-friendly. When the Mongols depart in search of greener pastures, no trace of their habitation is left behind. Recently, the yurts have become increasingly more popular with the environmentally conscious living in both Europe and the United States. The women are in charge of the interior decorations. They incorporate many colorful rugs and other decorative items throughout. These nomadic herdsmen know the Gobi Desert inside out, especially its inhospitable but more appealing southern part. It is found in the middle of a national park. 
the peaks of the Gurvan Saikan Ul mountain range seem to blast skyward. When translated, its name means the Three Beauties, even though the dark and rocky mountains feel quite gloomy in real life. The base camp for the expeditions into the mountains is equipped with yurts and herds of the load-bearing Bactrian camel. A sought-out sandy desert, the Kongorian Els, or Singing Sands, lies at the foot of the mountain. The dunes rise 300 meters high, 12 kilometers wide, and 100 kilometers long. Under the watchful eye of the three beauties, they seem to be the guardian of secrets. It is said that directly beneath the surface of this sandy kingdom lives the mythical worm Olgoi Chorchoi. The worm is said to attack humans from behind and suck out all their blood. The many animal skeletons found in the desert are more likely manifestations of severe heat or drought, and not so much the Olgoi Chorchoi. The desert is known to be unmerciful to lost animals and people. The giant worm story could easily have started with the ramblings of a delirious lost soul. Several historical records, and even some cryptozoological enthusiasts, actually mention the existence of the Algoi Chorchoi. But predominantly, this creature is only alive in the minds of the local people and their shamans. It is supposedly bright red in color, spits acid, and its sighting foretells approaching death. The legend may have originated as a warning to the foolish of the desert's impending dangers. But there are those who interpret and use archaeological findings from the Gobi to point to evidence of the monster. A dinosaur egg and the remains of the first mammals, dating back to the Jurassic period 164 million years ago, were discovered in the northern part of the desert. The Mongolians claim that once you know where to look, you can find a piece of prehistory in less than 30 minutes. The multicolored sand grains vary in weight. The wind carries the lightest layer, which is why the singing sands appear to change shape constantly. It appears that the three sisters and the singing desert only know how to take lives. On the other hand, the Gobi Desert is a place that can give life as well as take it. The rarely seen and highly endangered Przalski's horse can be spotted on the desert's periphery. Zoologists are slowly reintroducing this breed from zoos back into the wild. We can take off to the Yolin Am Pass in pursuit of unusual and varied life forms. It is here that we find myriad glacier-fed streams. In the winter, the pass is covered by a layer of ice several meters thick and many kilometers long. Due to the surrounding mountain walls, the pass remains shaded and so the ice thaws gradually. The last bits disappear sometime in September, shortly before the onset of another winter. Only a few years back, the ice remained year-round, but now, the relatively warmer summers of the last decade have brought an end to that. A slightly more acceptable climate due to higher altitude results in a greater variance of fauna and flora thriving here. The accessibility of water also helps. This is where the snow leopard lives, but he's rarely spotted. Horses are the universally accepted means of transport here, usurping cars. They require little maintenance and no fueling stations. The horse is a national symbol of Mongolia. It is as important to the people as their religion, Buddhism. Reaching the Tovkon Kid Temple is a long and tedious ordeal. In spite of its inaccessibility, it receives a great number of visitors. In 1936, there were over 50 temples in Mongolia. After the communists completed their purge, there were only a handful left, dozens of monks, 
occupied with the task of temple reconstruction as well as liturgy, reside at the Tofkon Kid Temple. The Tofkon Kid Temple is an important pilgrimage site for the Mongolians. It is the place where one of the greatest national thinkers, Zanabazar, chose to meditate. It is said that those who would lie on the floor of the adjoining cave will be purged of sin. Plentiful gifts testify to the gratitude of those previously purified. Impressive views of the surrounding woods are the ultimate reward for those men who reach the summit of Tovkon Kid. For some obscure reason, women are denied access to this vantage point. Pilgrims are drawn to the temple by Zanabazar's legacy. No lesser an attraction is a spring whose sacred waters are deemed to have healing properties. A contrast more stark may be difficult to find. The scorching dunes of the Singing Desert, as opposed to the 1100 kilometer long river Orkhan, the river valley is so strikingly beautiful, it was included as a national heritage site by UNESCO. The highlight of this river's course is a 20 meter high waterfall. The unpredictable weather can cause it to run dry, sometimes for as long as 10 consecutive months. In the springtime, during the thaw, the waterfall is quite impressive. It is highly advisable to visit Kovsgald Nur Lake in order to fully appreciate the extent of the diversity one finds in Mongolia. It lies in the north on the Russian border, and it is one of the largest lakes in the country. This lake, similar to one aspect of the Gobi, has a few numerical records to its credit. It was formed two million years ago, and as such, belongs in the league of the world's 17 oldest lakes. In some places, its depth exceeds 260 meters. It is a carefully protected water mass, separating the Central Asian steppes from the Siberian taiga. It supplies 17% of Mongolia with fresh water. Its surface area of almost 3,000 square kilometers makes it Mongolia's second largest lake. Its shores abound with incredible animal diversity, from the ibex and reindeer to the wolves, wolverines, and bears. An honored member of the bird kingdom is the endemic Hovsgol grayling. The underwater life is not quite as rich as in the nearby Lake Baikal. Even so, it is an important source of food for the local settlers. The incredible abundance of water and the life it sustains seems like a fairy tale to the traditional desert herdsmen. Similarly, the people from the lakeshores find it difficult to comprehend that there could exist places very near to them where water must be brought in from several kilometers away. As a result of protections like the prohibition of industrial fishing, the water here is crystal clear. The authorities meticulously regulate fishing. Fishermen living on the shores of the lake are forbidden to use large boats. One of the benefits from all the regulations results in a high quantity of fish that can be pulled from the lake. As a result, we can sit down to a fine meal of all the Kovsgolsk smoked fish, which include Siberian whitefish, Siberian grayling, Baigalai omul, and river perch. The lake and its beautiful surroundings continues to attract an increasing number of visitors, 
causing the development of local tourism to become vital. The nomadic Uyghurs arrive from the mountains and other distant parts of the country during warmer weather. They temporarily settle on the lake shores and go about their business, reindeer breeding, for example, to the curiosity of the locals from the surrounding towns and villages. This area of the lake might just well as be named Mongolian Switzerland. Dense forests form the southern border of the Siberian taiga. The dominant tree is the Siberian larch. Its resilience to the bitter cold makes it more than able to thrive here. It grows to a height of 50 meters and the trunk can be a meter in diameter. In the autumn, its leaves, resembling pine needles, turn yellow and adorn the forest floor. As the forests retreat, the Central Asian plains open up. The plains are an ideal environment for the rearing of animals, such as sheep, yak, and horses. Let us leave Mongolia behind and move over to a place where the sun, Islam, and the Dead Sea dominate. Jordan awaits. Over the past millennia, the rocky slopes of Jordan witnessed their fair share of bloody battles, new settlers, and other events recorded in the Old Testament. The first mention of civilization comes from the Paleolithic Age. In the years following, the area was ruled by different entities over time, from the Egyptian pharaohs, to the Persian Empire, to the Judean Kingdom, and to the Babylonians, to name just a few. All these cultures left behind traces of their reign, and all were aware of the unique qualities of the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea, also known as the Sea of Salt, lies in the Jordan Rift Valley. That valley also contains other significant lakes, none of which are as salty, or lie 378 meters below sea level. A liter of Dead Sea water contains an incredible 1.2 kilos of salt, making its water uninhabitable to all but a few bacteria. But humans found a good use for this water. According to the Bible, King David found refuge on its shores, and Herod the Great established one of the very first health spas here, intended for recreation and the healing of various diseases. The Egyptians utilized the salty water for mummification purposes. Today's visitors come here mostly to heal respiratory and skin diseases. Many beneficial minerals evaporate from the water, and the ultraviolet rays of the sun ensure a higher concentration of oxygen here than elsewhere. The water contains almost 10 times more salt than the ocean. As a result, people here enjoy incredible buoyancy. The salty crystals form a fascinating miniature landscape. The salty crust results from the condensation of minerals from the air and the diminishing water supplies. According to some rather skeptical prognoses, the Dead Sea is to vanish over the next 40 years. The Dead Sea is also being utilized for industrial production, its southern part, looking somewhat considerably different from the moonscape seen in our shot, has been taken over by mining companies. The substance of interest is potash, potassium carbonate. It is essential in the manufacture of soap, glass, fertilizers, and cyanide. Life in the desert is subject to unwritten and unchanging laws of uncompromising nature. Nowadays, the Bedouins have cars, used mostly to fetch water alongside their camel herds. In spite of such modern conveniences, they stick to very simple and traditional lives. 
One of the most important attributes of a Bedouin is hospitality. They are taught from childhood to invite a traveler into your home and feed him, because one day you too may need a place to sleep and a bite to eat. Traditional cuisine and the traditional sweet, sticky tea are a must. Living in such austere surroundings, it is not surprising that the Bedouins cherish friendship and hospitality above all. The land is saturated with history and as such attracts hundreds of visitors each year. Archaeological sites of the mysterious extinct Nabataean civilization drew awestruck anthropologists and archaeologists from around the world. The masses of tourists visiting the more than kilometer long pass are similarly dumbfounded. Having left the past behind, an incredible spectacle comes into sight. Known as the treasure chest, it is the symbol of the lost city of Petra. Indiana Jones was the most famous fictional visitor who traveled to Petra in search of the Holy Grail, which actually is the tomb of a Nabataean king. According to an Arabic belief, this is where Moses caused the rock to bring forth water when he struck the rock with his staff. A treasure of unimaginable worth is hidden in the facade according to a medieval legend. Petra has been a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1985. The sheer number of standing ruins could indicate that Petra was once densely populated. This wasn't the case. Petra was, above all, a ritual pilgrimage site and a cemetery. The remains of tombs are evident in every rock. The Nabataeans were nomads and merchants. They understood the desert and its secrets, enabling them to transport caravans of valuable goods such as frankincense, spice, and myrrh. They used their profits to prepare homes for their afterlives in the sandstone mountains. At the beginning of the second century, the Nabataeans clashed with the Romans. Their legacy was the Byzantine Episcopate and a wide range of authentic mosaics on the floors. Petra was slowly forgotten with the passing of time as its importance ceased to exist, together with the Nabataeans. The secret of the past was only known to the Bedouins who, until recently, inhabited some of the rooms in the rocks. Today, Petra is open to all. We bid farewell to the dignified Jordanian landscape. It has been through a lot and is rightfully praised as one of the most interesting tourist destinations. Allah Yismayak, God be with you, Jordan. Our journey to the miraculous nooks of our planet comes to an end, for now. On the next exploration of our compelling and bountiful planet Earth, we begin in Costa Rica, in an amazing rainforest. Here, they make delicious chocolate out of cocoa beans. Mother Nature is at her magnificent best, showcasing hundreds of plant and animal species. 
To wrap up, we'll take all precaution necessary to look at one of today's most active volcanoes. Green Monkeys will be our tour guides in the Kenyan lost city of Getty. Later, we will stop to wonder at the poetic symbiosis of wildlife in such close proximity to the capital, Nairobi. That's all right here on Miracles of Nature. We hope you'll join us. On our planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. Today, we begin in Costa Rica, in an amazing rainforest. Here, they make delicious chocolate out of cocoa beans. Mother Nature is at her magnificent best, showcasing hundreds of plant and animal species. To wrap up, we'll take all precaution necessary to look at one of today's most active volcanoes. Green monkeys will be our tour guides in the Kenyan lost city of Getty. Later, we will stop to wonder at the poetic symbiosis of wildlife in such close proximity to the capital, Nairobi. Despite its 200-year existence, some members of the animal kingdom remain oblivious to Nairobi's existence. A green belt of land lays between Nicaragua and Panama. It is Costa Rica, a tropical paradise where life remains inherently connected to the sea, rainforests, and history. In 1503, Christopher Columbus landed near Ilsa Uvita. The Spaniards followed soon afterwards, annexing the territory to their colonial empire. After being on the losing side of the Spanish-Mexican War in 1821, the Spanish could not stop the Costa Ricans from declaring independence. Inspired by nature's bounty, they named their land the rich coast, Costa Rica. Democracy took root in the mid-20th century, and Costa Rica has been one of the most peaceful Central American countries ever since. One of the first wild beasts that may be encountered here could very well be this mantled howler. It feeds on young leaves and can weigh up to 10 kilos. It is no loner. Groups of around 10 are often seen feasting together on the ever-present vegetarian delicacies. The Costa Rican coastline is constantly under siege. Waves of the Caribbean batter the coast from the east as if trying to break through the sliver of mainland and join the waters of the Pacific on the other side. It isn't the only never-ending battle taking place here. The nature of the mainland appears to besiege the sea in return. Its only ammunition is the opulent jungle lining the Caribbean coast. It appears that the only thing standing in the way of the jungle is a colonnade of palm trees. This silent battle has few spectators. It may be the regular soothing rhythm of waves washing the coast that results in a very relaxed way of life here. It's also the most likely reason why surfers from around the world flock to San Jose in search of the Pura Vida, or pure life, a life without rushing, intricacies, or confusion. It is very advisable to wear neoprene shoes, boots, or wellingtons when entering the Costa Rican jungle. It is wet here. We're talking misty rainforests. The cloud of vapor emitted by the rainforest each day ensures the prevailing humidity. This is no place for a rheumatic to be. The Costa Ricans truly love nature. They established 20 national parks and eight reservations here, covering an incredible 27% of the country's area. Bird watchers can admire over 850 types of birds, 
one of which is this boat-billed heron. It lives in the mangroves lining riverbanks and survives on crustaceans and fish. It can exceed half a meter in height, and it is apparent why it was given the name boat build, thanks to its unique bill. It is one of the most distinctive birds of the Costa Rican jungle. In this labyrinth of trees, bushes, and other sorts of plants, the entangled boughs form a safety net above the water. Curtains of greenery surround the canals and generate a humid duskiness. There is a slight resemblance to Venice, the only difference being that our unstable Costa Rican gondola floats among stout, lush tree palaces belonging to birds and reptiles. It's a good thing that no time is wasted nowadays by swapping film rolls and digital cameras. Looking around, it would be a great shame to miss anything. This turtle, for instance, or that plumed basilisk over there. It runs so fast that it can actually skim the water's surface, appearing to walk on water. This is why the locals call it the Basilisk of Jesus Christ. There are tens of thousands of plants here, including 1,200 species of orchid. One can only envy the sloth. He's got his whole life to take in the beauty of the jungle. We, unfortunately, have to move on. Cocoa trees grow all around a small house, otherwise enveloped by the jungle. Mrs. Ileana collects the cocoa beans, which she later barters for other foodstuffs at the market. What she doesn't barter, she uses to make chocolate. Don't be fooled by the name. The inside of the cocoa bean is not nearly as sweet as you might otherwise expect. The cocoa bean has a long journey ahead of it before it lands on our tables in the form of a luxurious treat. First, the beans are sliced open and placed in a chest where they are left to ferment for four days. Each fruit has about 50 beans. Having fermented for four days, each of these beans must then be left in the sun to dry before being roasted over the fire. The brown color signifies that the beans are now ready for the next phase, battering the beans so that the remaining pulp separates from them. The pulp would ruin the taste of the chocolate. Mrs. Ileana's grandma sieves it to get rid of all the impurities. When that's done, she handpicks the best beans. The result is a brownish powder which, to some extent, resembles chocolate. However, there is still something missing. It's now time for the final step in the production of pure, ecological bio-chocolate. The powder is mixed with water and cane sugar. This recipe is ancient. It goes back to the time of Montezuma, the Aztec ruler, who considered cocoa drink a delicacy. The Aztecs were more than aware of the aphrodisiac nature of chocolate. The word chocolate comes from the Aztecs. At last, the chocolate is wrapped in banana leaves. First, it is necessary to heat the leaves to make them flexible and prevent them from breaking when folded. The grandma painstakingly molds the chocolate Our treats are ready. Those may come in handy as we are now headed toward the distant waterfalls and a murky, forbidding volcano. Let us bid farewell to cocoa beans and the lovely handmade chocolate. The Costa Rican landscape is a gold mine in the eyes of developers. So much room and unused space. The Costa Ricans are duly proud. The Costa Rican government attempted to implement asphalt road building on a number of occasions to no avail. Despite the obvious fact that roads would have facilitated transportation and improved life in general, the locals refused. They are content with what they have and feel no need to deface their country with industrial and tourist infrastructure. And so it well may be that in a couple of decades, we will visit Costa Rica as one of the few remaining paradises left on Earth. If the Costa Ricans had a different mindset, Salto San Luis, located in the Monteverde province, would have been condemned to empty beer cans and other trash 
rather than the magnificence of the surrounding rainforest, streams, and even this two-story waterfall. The threat of unchecked tourism continues to loom over the natural wealth of Costa Rica. This is why the Costa Rican government devised a system of hanging bridges over the misty rainforests in the national parks. Visitors may thus admire the beauty of the rainforest without trampling plant life or stressing the animals. And of course, you can't pull up plants as a souvenir if you can't reach them. This experience could be rather unpleasant for those afraid of heights or suffering from vertigo. Count yourself lucky if you are not one of them. You can take advantage of the intricate system that allows you to be hauled even higher where you can admire the rooftop of the rainforest. It can be a breathtaking, awe-inspiring, adrenaline-pumping experience, and more than well worth it. Each tree is a world of its own, a real green microcosm in a great green macrocosmos. A few hundred years ago, the Spaniards were disappointed not to have discovered any gold in Costa Rica. At that time, they failed to notice the treasure all around them. Let us look around one last time. Dark, forbidding, and veiled in clouds, this is the Arenal Volcano. It is one of Costa Rica's symbols, and it is also one of the world's 10 most active volcanoes. The height is quoted as around because it erupts so often that resulting lava flow causes it to grow by approximately four meters per year. Its first eruption was about 7,000 years ago. During its most recent and mild eruption 12 years ago, 40 square kilometers of rainforest paid the price for its foul mood. Lately, Areno has been relatively quiet and well-behaved. Just one tiny earthquake per week. Perhaps it too has succumbed to the ever-present sense of pura vida all around. And now, we are off to Africa. Welcome to the Kenyan coast, bathed by the Indian Ocean. The sun is slowly rising above the Kenyan Swahili coast. The name alone signifies that we are about to meet a coastal culture. The word Swahili comes from the Arabic word Sahil, meaning coast, and the plural is Sawahel. It is a seafaring culture inherently linked to trade in the Indian Ocean. This coastline began to lure Arabic and Persian merchants as early as the first millennium AD. The area was rich in ivory, but the slave trade was by far the most lucrative at the time. Today, the coast is a source of revenue for fishermen and from tourists. Mombasa, a city of almost one million inhabitants. It has a distinguished past. First records of its existence come from 16th century Portuguese seafarers. The traffic anarchy can seem bewildering to the unsuspecting tourists. The locals, however, have it down to a science. The portrait of President Obama, whose grandparents came from Kenya, is to be seen on many matatu, the local version of a minibus taxi. Amid the busy street life, city parks are a welcome oasis of peace and quiet sought out by the locals, just to relax or enjoy a small picnic. In between the thick trunks of the baobab trees, they find ample shade. But attention must be paid to the large pods growing on the trees and falling at times. The pods do not fall of their own accord. It wouldn't be Africa if it were not for a few enterprising individuals operating in the crowns of the trees. And so, the trees offer relaxing, shady niches to some and a livelihood to others. The baobab tree is very popular among the people. The leaves are considered great eating when included in salads. The seeds are used as a thickening agent in cooking, and people use the ground bark as a cure for fever. Collection of this fruit may seem a risky business, 
but the wide bows are sidewalks to the feet of an experienced collector. The baobab fruit is commonly used in Swahili cuisine. It offers more vitamin C than oranges and provides more calcium than cow's milk. It is often referred to as the fruit of the future. One of the most sought after commodities in this part of Africa is candy made from baobab fruit. The pulp, called mabuyu, is cleaned of the fibers. The fibers are utilized in the making of purees and as an additive to milk. No kitchen utensils required here. The pulp is carefully selected. This is followed by the preparation of a red dye with a dash of chili. When it's ready, the pulp is colored in the dye and sweetened. And there it is, a candy treat. The baobab is, indeed, a tree worth singing praise to, not just due to its sheer size, but because of how practical it is. Not all cities survived the pitfalls of centuries past. For unknown reasons, Life suddenly vanished from the city of Getty at the end of the 17th century. The city is veiled in mystery. Though no official records exist, the expanse of observable ruins gives silent testimony to the wealth and glory of Getty. In the first half of the 20th century, archaeologists unearthed the remains of a port and a tomb dating back to the end of the 14th century. Neither gave away any secrets. It is almost as if Getty was cursed, or that something wanted to deny it ever existed at all. It is a place perfectly suited for an H.P. Lovecraft story. The city was devoured by the jungle, and its ruins are now occupied by a troop of green monkeys. Their monkey ancestors may have lived here a few hundred years ago, but they also didn't keep any written records. The sheer size of Getty, as well as its mystery, is breathtaking. Baobab trees are to be found here, too. And the green monkeys aren't about to miss out on the tree's delicious fruit. Green monkeys live in great troops, and the hierarchy within the troops is infallible. According to many scientists, these monkeys are able to articulate threats they sense from other animals. They use a specific screech, for instance, when a leopard lurks nearby. They will use a screech with different characteristics when they spot a snake or see an eagle. At a very young age, monkeys learn the sounds from their elders. Similar to naughty adolescents, they derive great pleasure and entertainment from freaking out the adults using these warning sounds just for the heck of it. The mother monkeys have no tolerance for such silly pranks and are determined to teach their young good manners. The youngsters are in for a good walloping, that is, if the mothers manage to catch them. Because monkeys have a natural tendency to be aggressive, the monkeys hang around the visitors, having learned that food is to be found in all sorts of dodgy places. Monkeys are not the only animals thriving in the surrounding forest. This is the single largest stretch of solid coastal jungle in East Africa. Eucalyptus dominates here, and the illegal exploitation of timber has taken its toll. For the time being, the jungle is holding its own. It is large and vast. As a result, animals are able to continue to find refuge there. An abundance of endangered bird and butterfly species gather here, as does a herd of elephants. 
Unfortunately, the growth is too thick and impenetrable for us to see them. A man without a donkey is a donkey. This is one of many Swahili proverbs. It applies especially on the island of Lamu. Its capital, Lamu, dates back to the beginning of the 16th century. The unimaginable wealth of its inhabitants no doubt came from the trade in ivory and slaves. The city has managed to maintain its character and remains a unique example of Swahili architecture. It has been included by UNESCO as a cultural heritage site. Clearly, no other means of transport but a donkey would do in its narrow, winding streets. Two tractors appeared on the island recently, and the police force can also brag of its own vehicle. This is no match for the donkeys, though. There are 3,000 donkeys on the island, so they ensure that they are the majority of the interstate transportation. The goods are offloaded in the port. From there, they reach their designated destination atop one of these stubborn creatures. The baskets used as saddlebags are made of palm leaves. The leaves are first dried, then the women weave them into narrow strips, which are eventually sewn together. The same technique has been used forever. Mattresses and other merchandise made of palm leaves were exported from Lamu. Their import is mentioned everywhere, including on the island of Zanzibar. Kenya's capital, Nairobi, is nicknamed Nairobi because of its staggering criminality. Even though these animals are living in what amounts to the city suburbs, these zebras and wildebeests haven't got a clue. They live peacefully within sight of the city, but at the same time sufficiently far away from it. They are yet another living example of how transient the boundary between wilderness and civilization is in Africa. So why don't the animals fear civilization? Once uncontrolled hunting was abolished, the animals returned to the city periphery, barely seven kilometers from the city center. The Nairobi National Park was established, a wild game reserve accessible even to those who have very little time to spend with the animals. It is more of an open-air zoo. Here, zebras are rather common. They are in great abundance because they migrate across the savanna from July to August. You won't sight any of the African Big Five here, namely leopard, lion, elephant, rhinoceros, or buffalo. Along with zebra, the more common animals include wildebeest, giraffe, and ostriches. Don't expect the ostrich to hide its head in the sand, though. They are so accustomed to seeing throngs of tourists and schoolchildren they remain absolutely unfazed by humans. You may encounter wildebeest grazing freely on the plains. Springboks and antelope of all shapes and sizes are also commonplace. Herons prudently thrown at water holes. Water holes are essential for the survival of all in the savanna, and generic animosities are forgotten here. Giraffes float by majestically, looking down upon the world. They deserve their god syndrome, being the living proof of Darwin's evolutionary theories. They stretched so far and so long to reach the highest and furthest growth that they survived. Evil gossip has it that Darwin only reached this conclusion having heard from the natives and taken for his own the legends on how the giraffe originated. But that is an entirely different chapter. For the moment, we are still in the Nairobi National Park and we can take pleasure from nature untroubled by human intrusion. The sun begins to set over Africa and with it, ends our ventures into the stunning Kenyan and Costa Rican jungles. But for how long will we have the ability to enjoy these jungles? For only as long as we are willing to accept the responsibility of being good stewards to the land and our environment.
our journey to the miraculous nooks of our planet comes to an end for now. On the next exploration of our compelling and bountiful planet Earth, we will visit Iceland and marvel at its numerous hot springs. But it is also steeped in a rich cultural history. And there's nothing quite like the rejuvenating thermal baths and breathtaking Nordic vistas you find in Iceland. Tropical Laos is also inseparably linked to nature. Only here, monochromatic white glaciers are replaced by lush green scenery. We will lose ourselves in the intricate cave labyrinth of the Laotian underground only to re-emerge into the sunlight and get up close and personal with the water buffalo on the Mekong River. That's all right here on Miracles of Nature. We hope you'll join us.